Hi, my name is Pamela Fuseli, and I'm the host of Popping the Bubble Wrap. Are you the person in your family who worries about the safety of others, about buying safety products and using them? Are you yelling, yes, that's me? Then this is the podcast for you. Raising a child or children can be a hair-raising undertaking, and keeping them safe is your priority. Parachute's Popping the Bubble Wrap podcast explores what you really need to think about and provides easy tips on prevention strategies. No bubble wrap here, though. Let's not kid ourselves. Parenting is exhausting. You need to find your moments of peace and quiet where you can get them. Usually that's when your child or children are sleeping. But for this time to actually be peaceful, we need to know our kids are going to be safe while they're snoozing. Today, we're going to talk about what types of products are out there that can keep our kids safe during sleep and what might be more risky than beneficial. Today, I have parents Erica Stone and Scott Baudin joining me, as well as our expert, Dr. Daniel Rosenfield, pediatric emergency physician in Toronto and specialist in child injury prevention. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Erica and Scott, first, tell me about your downtime if you get any. Do you find that time that your kids are asleep is a time for you to relax or at least do something for yourself? Erica, maybe I'll start with you. There is not a lot of downtime with a small baby, that's for sure. My little one is three months and sleep when the baby sleeps is a real piece of advice that I act, everyone hates, but it's the only thing you can do. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely tiring, but I get it in when I can. You get it in when you can. What about you, Scott? Is that the same for you? Get your sleep while they're sleeping? Absolutely. Uh, and that ends up being very little <laughs> sleep. I used to read about 30 books a year before I had a kid. And now my child just turned two. And I think I've read three books in two years. So downtime has become uh, very much sort of a dissociative uh, part of my life as opposed to any sort of creative engagement. Mm. Uh, But that's okay. We'll get it back one day. (laughs) One day. There are so many products out there that are marketed to parents like you for sleep for sleeping safety or just the sleep environment. There's play pens and bumper pads, cribs, bunk beds when they get old enough. Um, Erica, what kinds of products do you have in your home that that help keep sleep time safe for Chloe? <laughs> what what did you buy? I mean, I know she's she's quite young, but did you like buy a bassinet? Do you have a crib? What do you have around the house for her to sleep in? I think I have all of the above. I have a crib in her room, which she's not in yet. So it is kind of just this perfect little nursery that is fairly uh, (laughs) unused for sleep. But uh, and then we have a bassinet as well uh, in my bedroom. And we also use pack and plays. So I also have a pack and play on each floor of our house uh, so that there is a safe sleeping space in all. I have a dog, so that's a factor for me as well. But uh, each floor actually has, um, sounds very luxurious, but it's it's mostly so that I don't have to take the stairs. It's a lazy factor <laughs> more than anything. Uh, so those are my things and monitors as well. I have a video monitor and uh, I have an audio one as well that I use when mm. she's in one of the other locations. Of course, I don't have a video at each location. So I right. have just a temporary uh, audio one so I can hear her <laughs> realistically, but uh, but I still use those as well. Right. So you were you you went with a couple of different options for for sleep time. Scott, what's been your experience? What what have you used? Uh, at, you know, is your child in a crib? Did you use a bassinet when they were younger? I know they're they're two now, but yes, we did use a bassinet when he was younger, and uh, he starts. We'll start in a crib, and we'll we'll try and go as long as we can in a crib, and then. Um, after you know a couple of hours, uh, we'll have a discussion uh, about whether we're going to continue that. Uh, he'll often win the discussion, and he'll end up in bed with one of us. And um, we try. Sometimes my partner and I will just need to either sleep on the couch, or when we were in our old place, sleep in a in a guest room. Um, we don't have that anymore. So, but we do have this sort of uh, attachment to the bed 
which sort of makes sort of sort of like a hospital mm-hmm. bed guardrail kind of situation where uh, when when the child is sleeping next to us, if uh, if he were to roll roll over to the side, that you know he there is um, uh, there is something something to catch him there. Uh, if, if he happened to move without waking us, which doesn't usually happen, but just mm-hmm. a, is a safety precaution. And we have, uh, as Erica said, we have, you know, we have the, the monitor, we have the Google, the Google mm-hmm. nest, and that uh, works well for us for, for keeping an eye on him. It's such a great feature to be able to just uh, zoom in on the screen, just to do a little zoom in with your fingers and you can watch them even the most minute, uh, breaths being taken. It's we're we're really lucky mm-hmm. in this uh, age of parenting to have these tools at our disposal. And you have a you have a little one on the way, so some of this may change when you have a second <laughs> baby in the house. Yes, uh, in terms of who who is sleeping where, and uh, I think we'll we'll probably have to um, say goodbye to the crib because we well we've decided that we're not going to let him cry it out and. Uh, and, and so that means that mom and dad are are sleeping with him uh, for the most part. So once the second baby arrives, we don't have uh, we'll we'll probably have to get him into some sort of toddler mm-hmm. bed. Um, and then maybe a question that I uh, would would ask is because we, we were thinking that I might sleep in a double bed or something beside him, but if he were in that on his own, or is that going to be too? too much space Mm. for him. So a bigger bed. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll put that to, uh, Dr. Rosenfield in a second. (laughs) Um, can you talk to me a little bit about Erica, about how you made choices about you, what you bought? Did you talk to friends? Did you get information from your physician, your parents, you know, what, did you find it challenging to buy the products that you did? I found it interesting going and doing the registry um, at, you know, big box baby store, uh, walking around. And I did find that part a bit overwhelming. You know, you're in a store where you think everything is is being, you know, marketed to you and your baby. And um, I found myself adding some things and then going home and, and kind of researching and being like, actually, that's not something I was on the fence about it. But now I know for sure Um that's something that we shouldn't do. Um, so I found that to be a bit challenging. I know the, I took a public health course, kind of a, you know, new parent uh, course that was offered by public health in my area. And the nurse running the the um, course was uh, very helpful to say like these, all of these things, like take them off your registry, like do not you know, don't use any of these things. This is all you need. You really just need, um, you know, a bassinet. Um, and even then there's a million different types of bassinets now with mm. the fold, fold down sides and the different sizes. And some of them have, like even mine has like a mesh, um, side to it, but you can put on like a non mesh side to it. Um, and it's like, now I can't see my baby at all. So I liked having the <laughs> mesh so I could at least see the baby from, you know, it, I lie in my bed and I can see the baby right through the mesh. Um, right. so I found that challenging, uh, certainly yet in, in looking through the cribs, I felt confident, confident about, I think it's mm-hmm. the other pieces like the pack and play, mm-hmm. um, same thing. I was like, you know, what weight limit is the top part of the bassinet, the bassinet level of the pack and play versus the lower level. And the weight limits aren't that easy to find on the instructions. So even now I'm getting to a point where I'm like, is she too big for now? This, uh, this level mm-hmm. of the of the pack and play. So that's one thing that's been challenging as well. Yeah, there's so many questions. And sometimes you don't know until you go to use the product, whether it's going to work for you. Like you said, you you replace the mesh with, with something else. And then it was like, oh, now I can't see. Uh, now I can't see the baby. And the, I don't like that. So yeah, it's, it's sometimes mm-hmm. it's, it's trial and error and experience. And yeah, uh, Scott, yeah. Erica just talked about like the number of products or things that you think you have to have when you have a child. Um, you know, how did you make you and your partner make choices about what you would what you would use? You're obviously, you know, you have a question about beds and, you know, when we we're getting uh, to a bit older kids and their sl- sleep. Did you find it challenging to know what to what to buy and what not to? It certainly is overwhelming and you definitely um uh, we were definitely getting drawn into the 
uh, marketing strategies of feeling like we were bad parents if we didn't have every gizmo and every contraption possible. But we we were fortunate that both of our closest friends have families already. So we were able to sort of use them as a, as a guidepost and uh, very, very fortunate to inherit a lot of these items from our friends. And or in a few cases, we picked uh, picked up some new items. But it was um, we we I I read a few books that had some very helpful lists of what what you need to get started and and then uh, and then sort of looking at looking at what my friends mm-hmm. had and uh, going going from there. Doctor Rosenfield, Daniel, <laughs> can you tell us about some of the sleep products on the market that maybe claim to be safe, but are actually more risky or comment on, you know, what you've heard Scott and Erica talking about. There's so many products out there. Do we really need all of them? Yes. So (laughs) they're all great questions. So the first thing, full disclosure, I am also a pretty uh, new-ish parent myself. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. So I'm not particularly far removed from all of these pressures. And I know firsthand that Sleep for both parent and baby is the only thing on your mind when you're not getting any. So I can absolutely (laughs) empathize to the new parents out there, or not even that new, um, who aren't getting very much (laughs) sleep. It's absolutely essential for your own personal care, babies, and the whole family unit. So um, all of this rings very kind of close to to me and my my personal, my family's uh, lived experience. Um, So the first things, uh, the first thoughts I would say are... um, I feel bad for all of us. The marketing machines from these, all of these respective companies are brilliant. They know how to pull up the heartstrings. The psychology is very strong. They know how to sell their products. The first thing I'll tell everyone is that almost none of these have actually good research data supporting their use. And when I say products, I mean like literally everything, anything from, you know, this vibration will make them fall asleep faster, or this sound machine uh, is soothing to their ears, or, um, this motion is clinically proven. None of this is clinically proven. And the way you know that is show, ask them to show you the clinically peer-reviewed jur- uh, journal <laughs> article, and they don't exist. So I always tell parents, uh, it's, a, it's an impossible job. You're doing what you think is best for your child, which is always the, what I see number one in the emergency department is, well, I want what's best for my child, of course. Um, and so, of course, when you're sleep deprived and you're disinhibited, mm-hmm. And it's so easy to buy things nowadays online. You're going to do that if you think there's even a 1% chance of improving your sleep. So I always try and say, be generous with yourself. You know, most of these products aren't necessarily actively dangerous, but most of the claim ver- verified or validated in any sense of the word. Some of the products I kind of roll my eyes at and think this could be dangerous. Um, you know, the things that jump to the top of mind in that space are weighted blankets for babies. Um, I didn't, I wasn't aware of these when I was, when my kids were like in the newborn period, but I've saw a few of my friends because of the work I do have forwarded me links on Instagram or other social media sites to these types mm-hmm. of products. And to me, these are just terrible ideas. Um, weighted blankets for adults, even those, um, again, how good the data is that they support sleeping, I'm not so sure. Um, but we know that restricting a baby from in any way, shape or form uh, by putting any weight on their chest wall is a very bad idea and p- can potentially contribute um, to bad outcomes. So that would be one of the ones that I've seen that I just absolutely stay away from. Um, no matter how desperate you are for sleep, there are lots of other <laughs> things you can try before you land on putting a weight on, on that infant. Um, you know, there's so many products that come and go these days. That I don't really ha- I have a great, great mm-hmm. um, amount of other examples. If, if Scott or uh, Erica or even yourself, Pam, have seen other things, I'm happy to weigh in my two cents. But that was the one that really jumped out at me as a, uh, you know, uh, a solution without a problem. The idea of just, well, let's keep making this weighted blanket smaller and smaller and smaller until it's a, the, new, the smallest of people like makes no sense to me and, uh, and I don't think should be around. The one thing that we often get when we tell people not to use bumper pads or pillows in in the in the cribs the way that they you know hit their head on the crib is not going to hurt them um, but you know babies who can't roll and and things like that have the potential to suffocate against a bumper pad, those types of things, I think. Yep. Um, and I think the back to sleep. So making sure that, yep. you know, they're sleeping on their back. And those are some things that might be very different from, say, when, uh, you know, Erica and Scott, your your parents or even grandparents, you know, were raising their kids. And, and those do have um, good research behind them in terms of, you know, whether they are or aren't safe. 
that's a great point there. You know, I don't want to say there's no data to support some safe sleep practices. The the ones you really highlighted in the last 10, 20, 30, even 40 years of research that are shown unequivocally to decrease the rate of sudden infant death syndrome or sudden unexplained infant death um, are going to be back to sleep, uh, non-smoking environments. Uh, you know, so if you are a smoker, it doesn't matter even if you only smoke outside, any substance used by the parent, uh, any um, pa- uh, thick padding, blankets, pillows, um, you know, loose fitting bedding. And I'll say in the era of Instagram where people are showing off their, their the nursery, it's always full of pillows in the crib. And I'm like, that's fine for the photo. Mm-hmm. Those all have mm-hmm. to be gone by the time the child's going to bed. Um, there's actually some emerging data talking about pacifier use as protect as a protective factor. Um, so, you know, it's not that every baby needs to have a pacifier. Some people don't like that idea. That's okay. But there is data that says a pacifier once mm. uh, breastfeeding is established can be helpful and reduce um, rates of that. Uh, and, and nursing period, human milk um, has been shown to be a protective factor for that as well. So those are ones where there's lots of unequivocal, good peer reviewed research to say this will decrease rates of SIDS and things in that space. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so that but so that was a good point. So yeah, no, thanks for that. We're gonna take a quick break and be back in a moment. Nearly three decades ago, Amazon set out to be Earth's most consumer-centric company, where people can discover and purchase the widest possible selection of safe and authentic goods. As part of that mission, they obsess over earning and maintaining trust by ensuring that they provide a trustworthy shopping experience. Amazon is dedicated to helping you make informed choices and use your purchases safely. Visit www.amazon.ca slash product safety and usage and explore expert safety tips, articles, and videos from our partners to ensure a secure shopping experience. Scott and Erica, before the break, um, Daniel was telling us about, you know, some of the things that were, you know, proven to be safe and others that don't don't really work or don't actually have good evidence around. Do any of the things that he talked about surprised you? Erica, maybe I'll start with you. I'm not surprised that there's anything out there that's being marketed um, to parents to sleep more. Like I know that sound machines are a very, a very common one. Um, I think finding that data and discerning between whether or not it is, you know, something that's safe versus what is marketing data is really difficult for a parent. Um, So that part doesn't surprise me too much. Um, I did sort of have a question about swaddling. Swaddles is one too, that there's a lot of different versions of swaddles being marketed out Mm -hmm. there. The ones where their arms are kind of pinned um, like a little, um, there's like a swaddle. It's like a little Houdini. It's a name of what it sounds like Houdini and it's, it, it, I think it's because it's so challenging to get out of, which is, is a bit concerning. Um, so swaddles, I think, is another topic that I, I find mm. kind of gray. Um, when I took the, the course, uh, the nurses said we swaddle now with arms out so that they can, you know, show hunger cues and, and all that. So we never swaddled our arms for our baby. Uh, but in the hospital, they did swaddle our baby with the arms. Um, so then that was a bit <laughs> confusing. Um, and my baby rolled on her side quite a lot in the first week in two weeks. And I was shocked. I was horrified. I was like, Oh my gosh, she's already on her side. Like that's terrifying. Um, and then I was like, maybe we shouldn't swaddle her at all. Um, so I was in sleep sacks very young. Um, so that was another piece as well, where I was like, can I be in a sleep sack this young and safely? Mm -hmm. So that was, I know that's a question and all sorts of things, but I think swaddles is a whole other, a huge topic in sleep. Um, and, uh, mm-hmm. and especially with new ones coming out on the market. Yeah. Maybe Daniel, do you want to answer that question or comment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's a great question. And, and if that one's an, a one of, a, I'll say evolving thought. So, um, the first thing in the hospital context, typically they'll swaddle because the babies are typically, especially if they're in the NICU, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking to your baby specifically, but they're monitored. So it's very different, um, from mm, that context. Yeah. And a lot she of people, was, so that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, <laughs> that makes sense around on oxygen monitoring. So that's much safer that in, uh, in hospital settings. And we could talk afterwards about the marketing devices for home, which we do not recommend for oxygen saturation monitoring for a variety of reasons. Um, but, uh, so the answer about the, um, sleep sacks is that they're actually now, they're not ex- explicitly recommended, but they're a good option. If you're looking to keep your child, you know, comfortable, warm and have a blanket without having a blanket. 
Um, especially the one, and most of them are with arms out. They either have sleeves or are sleeveless. But the the thinking over the past decade or so is to move towards uh, away from swaddling like the baby burritos that you see in the hospital, um, and towards letting uh, babies have their arms free. And uh, just because of the, exactly the way your baby was described, Eric, they roll pretty early. Uh, and certainly, if you roll and can't move your arms and can't move back to where you started, that is a potential suffocation risk. In addition mm-hmm. to the swaddles becoming looser and then becoming just a loose blanket. I think one thing about, you know, childhood development, especially for those who have really young ones and are just learning. And as you are, Erica, because your baby said it's three months, every day at that age is a different skill and they don't run by a specific clock. Every baby is going to be doing different things at different times. And so if you assume oh, they don't roll till three months and you put them in, you know, the, the Houdini straight jacket uh, and they roll at two months because that's what your baby does. That's going to be a problem. So I, mm. I am a general fan of explaining that we don't know which baby is going to do what at what point. And so we should just have generically safe principles for all of them. So with that in mind, unweighted regular sleep sacks, more than acceptable um, not to not to do swaddling. The other thing that we used to do, and again, you probably see in the NICU, um, is hats. We don't recommend hats anymore. Again, one of the thoughts of factors that weighs into um, uh, it, in the research in sudden infant death is overheat the baby overheating. Uh, and so, putting a, a hat on a baby who's already in a warm room, who's already bundled, or wearing a sleep sack is is unnecessary. So um, that's just one of the things I've seen a lot of, and that there's some new literature and new recommendations advising against it. So that's uh, mm. it's always worth bringing up. Thanks, Daniel. Scott, um, did anything that uh, that we've talked about so far, did anything surprise you or do you have any questions that have come up with the things you listen um, to? Uh, I guess now that my child is turning two, um, is when could you, uh, he still sleeps in a crib, when can you start introducing pillows into their sleep? When he sleeps in our bed, he seems to be craving crawling up, Mm. putting his head beside mine. But I don't know if that is because he wants to be just close to me or if that's because dad has a good (laughs) pillow that he... Of course, it's because dad is a great cuddler and has nothing to do with your pillow. Um, The short answer to that is, you know, at age two, presuming he's developmentally normal, because obviously if he's two-year-old, if we're talking about other generic children who are maybe developmentally delayed or don't have the, you know, typical physical abilities of a two-year-old... it, we're t- it's a very different discussion than we're talking two months. So two years, I presume the child is walking. I presume they're able to, you know, tell you when something's wrong. They're rolling around in the bed. They're probably kicking you. So they can use blankets. They can use pillows um, kind of regularly. A lot of them won't, won't know what to do with them at that age. They'll just be, you know, you'll put them in there confused, but others will like it. So to me, it's more of a trial and error. See what, again, what gets the two-year-old, what, the, what do they like? Um, I know you asked at the very beginning about bed size. Honestly, there's no, this is kind of, I won't say it's common sense. They, it's whatever they prefer. I'll tell you, most children, a giant bed, they might be feel very foreign in. Most beds at that age are small because they're small people. Um, but there's nothing inherently wrong with it. What I will say, the only thing I'll say from my emergency work um, is think about the height of the bed, guardrails on the bed. There's often these transition beds that have built-in little guardrails uh, because they're just learning to be in a bed by themselves. And they were used to a, a crib where they rolled into it and rolled into a wall. Um, we see lots of kids who kind of fall out of the bed. And if they're falling out of a low bed onto carpet, you never make it to the emergency room. But if the bed's three and a half feet tall with a padded mattress onto hardwood, or tile, you often end up in my emergency department. So that's, to me, the more common, a common sense approach to to bedding as children get mm. older. That's a really good point. And I think this conversation has really shown that, you know, sleep or not is not an easy question. <laughs> and there's so much to, to think about. But there's also a lot of things that you might think you need that you don't need. Uh, and to seek out some credible sources, um, like parachute.ca. We have lots of information there. Health Canada has good information on products that have been regulated. And and places like the Canadian Pediatric Society has uh, really good information. So going to those credible sources uh, is really important. So Scott, Erica, Daniel, I really appreciate the time you've taken to come on this podcast talking about your experience and challenges with sleep, (laughs) not only safe sleep, but just sleep uh, uh, in its um, true form. And to end the podcast, I just want to wish you and your child more sleep time. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Pat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. Popping the Bubble Wrap is a podcast of Parachute, Canada's national injury prevention charity. We release episodes monthly. Visit us at parachute.ca 
and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Parachute Canada. Don't keep us a secret though. Help other parents find this podcast by sharing the link to popping the bubble wrap and taking a second to submit a review. It really does help. Popping the Bubble Wrap is produced by Story Studio Network.